the bullseye. Today we're going to look at the concept of being in God's will. This has been on my heart um, for a while, just being in God's will. So let's, let's, let's pray. Uh, dear God, just anoint this message, God, and just um, it's all about you, not about me. And I just thank you for this message that you gave to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Bullseye. When you hear that word, you usually think in your mind the center of a shooting target. How many of you guys ever shot a gun or a bow and arrow? All right, most of us. So we're used to the bullseye, right? Yep, it's a, it's a real thing. Um, if you ever shot a gun or arrow, the goal is to hit the bullseye, isn't it? It's a guy that lives uh, by me. Um, I won't say his name, but um, they called him Boom Boom. And I was just like, why do they call you Boom Boom? And if they, I guess he was, like, he was like 10 feet from a target, and he kept on shooting. And if that, when he got done, he didn't hit nothing. They call him Boom Boom. You know, um, when you do, when you, if you ever shot a gun or arrow, the goal is to hit the bullseye. When this happens, um, you're on target, right? That means that you're shooting correctly. You get, a sen- you get a sense of pleasure, don't you? You know that you, where you're shooting, where you aimed, you hit it. I think one of the worst parts of a bullseye is not being able to hit it or even get close to it. You know, let's be honest, this happens many times in, um, in our lives and throughout our lives. We, we, we're going for something, we're going for the bullseye, and, we don't, and whatever we're going for, we don't get it. And it, it gets frustrating, doesn't it? It gets really frustrating. You know, I think many times it looks like this. You know, we set a goal and try to hit that goal. When we end up not hitting that goal, we get mad. We get mad. And when we get mad, we often get mad at others. We blame them because we can't hit something that we think we should hit. You know, this can, this can end uh, relationships, you know, friendships. It can end marriages. It can end job positions. You know what? I think I should be the director, but I'm not getting a director position, so I'm going to just, I'm going to jet out of here. I'm gone. You know, sometimes we blame ourselves. You know, we get mad at ourselves for a goal we made but can't, but can't hit. This is dangerous too, though, because this can lead to depression. It can lead to anxiety. You know, it can even result in suicide. You know, people say, you know what, I should be here. This is what I feel like I should be doing. I've been trying. I've been putting all my effort towards it, and I didn't get it. You know, what, what's the point of living? Some people do that. Some people commit suicide. And lastly, we sometimes blame God. We put, blames on, put blame on God. And this is the most dangerous. We sometimes have the nerve, or maybe even more accurately, we, accurately, we feel we have the right to blame God for not hitting the bullseye. You know, this can cause hostility towards God, which can lead to backsliding, and ultimately, it can break down, break your anchor to God. Last, I think last time I, um, I was preaching up here, I was talking about your anchor. If you don't have an anchor to God, you're, you're, in, you're in dangerous trouble. And, and if, you're putting, if you're putting blame on God for something that you're trying to hit, that's going to cause trouble too, because you know what? Anchors are made of metal, and metal can rust. And once you get rusty, you break that anchor, and you're gone. You know, all of this is due, is due to, to trying to hit a bullseye that we think we should hit. You know, the problem with hitting the bullseye is that we have a tendency to set up, set up our bullseye blindly without God involved. You know, how many people, how many of you guys say, uh, you know what, I think I should be doing this. I should be doing that. And how many of you, and how many people do you see, you know, sometimes people just step into it blindly and say, you know what, I think I should be doing this. I think I should be doing that. But, uh, you know, without any type of confirmation from God. You know, we all can do that. And so I can, make, I can say, you know what, I'm going to be a brain surgeon. I'm not going to be a brain surgeon because I don't have the talent. I don't have the skill set. And if, and if I set myself up, if I set myself up like that, I'm going to get mad at myself. And I might fall victim to getting mad at others, myself, or even God, for something he didn't tell me to do. The problem with hitting the bullseye is that we have a tendency to set up our own bullseye blindly or without God involved. We set, our, we set up blind bullseyes in our life and shouldn't be there. That's the, that's the, that's the biggest thing. We shouldn't, we shouldn't even be um, setting uh, bullseyes up in our life because it's not up to us. 
When you have God's will, it's God's will, it's not our will. You know, our will sometimes is, is doing things that we want to do, but it's not God's will. You know, we shoot at targets that aren't necessary. You know, it's great to have goals in your life, but, um, and I think goals are important and they're necessary, but, um, ha- so, but goals is not the issue. The issue is shooting at the bullseye that you're not supposed to shoot at, that you're not, just, you're not supposed to aim at. And we have a lot of people walking around, friends, family, and stuff like that. They're shooting at a target they shouldn't even be shooting at. It shouldn't even be up on a piece of paper to shoot at. It shouldn't even, it shouldn't even, it shouldn't even be nothing involved with that, but, we, they, but, it, but it is. You know, I really, I really feel that God gives us all bullseyes to shoot at. I think he, I think he does. Your bullseye might not be, may not be the same as others around you, and this is totally okay. Some people, you know, God gives us all directions, and God gives us everything. He, he says, you know what, I want you to go here, I want you to be here, I want you to do that, I want you to do that. And it's not going to be the same. You can't piggyback on somebody and be like, you know what, my dad was a, a doctor, so I'm going to be a doctor you know, that's just, that's not how it works. And if you've met people like that before, some of these people that follow their um, parents' footsteps are the most unhappiest people because they're doing it out of pressure. You know, God has different plans and paths of life for each one of us. Because of this, we all have different bullseyes. You've got to remember that we all have different bullseyes. Just because I did something, my kids are not going to have the same bullseye that I have. And I definitely don't have the same bullseye Catherine has. I'm not an accountant. I don't want to do accounting. You know, the thing I want you to all understand is that in order to hit any bullseye, you must be in God's will. That's the biggest thing right there, being in God's will. And, I've been, and God's been putting this just on my heart, this, this, whole, this whole sermon today, because if you're not in God's will, you're not going to be happy. You're going to cause destruction anywhere. You're almost, you, I, I want to go to the point of even saying you're almost going to be a cancer to everybody around you. No matter how hard you try or how many times you shoot at a target, if it's not the target you should be shooting at, you will never be able to hit it. I want to repeat that. I want to repeat that because I want that to get etched into your brain. No matter how hard you try or how many times you shoot at a target, if it's not the target you should be shooting at, you will never be able to hit it. You know, this is a common problem I believe believe that Christians encounter. Some Christians, some Christians have been shooting at the same target their whole life without any type of result, nothing that comes remotely close to the target hole. We're talking about they're shooting like feet and miles away from the target, and after that, they get frustrated. But today we're going to look at one person in history that did, not, that, that did not encounter this problem. His name was Jesus. Does anybody know who he is? Raise your hand if you, if you know who this guy is. Okay. You guys, I'm glad you do. Jesus was the greatest target shooter in history because because he was in his father's will at all times and knew what bullseye to aim for during his life. Mm. Today, we're going to look at the life of Jesus and how he lived his life right in the center of God's will. He wasn't over here. He wasn't over here. He was right in the bullseye. And if you look at a bullseye, you got a pretty big um, target for a bullseye, right? We're going to start off, uh, we're going to be in the book of Luke. You know, we see in Luke uh, chapter 2 that when Jesus was a child, he was hitting the bullseye already. I'm saying, because you got to think about that. Age just has not, age has nothing to do with bullseye. You can be 99, you could be 4 years old. You can hit the bullseye. Age has nothing to do with it. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. And this is when Jesus, when he was a child, he, um, he, was, uh, he was at the synagogue, and he was, uh, he was basically um, learning, he was listening to them, he was asking them questions, and people were just like, you know what, man, this kid's got something. He's like a brainiac. So starting with um, verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. 
and Joseph and his mother did not know of it. Did not know it. How many kids, I'm saying, when you go to the store, they linger sometimes. Like, you're walking up there, they just linger around in the toil, toil or the video game. You'll be like, man, you better get over here. Verse 44, but, suppo- but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. So they went on a day's journey. I mean, we're talking about like uh, at a store like this, like, you know, like a couple seconds, a day's journey. Verse 46, now, so it was that after three days they found him in a temple sitting in the midst of, midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. I know his parents probably were a little irritated with him. You might have got that, you might have got that butt whooped. 47, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. 49, and he said to them, why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? My father's business? My father's business? Bullseye. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. We're going to go 51 to 52. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You know, in in verse 49, Jesus said, I was about, I am about my father's business. You know, Jesus was hitting the bullseye as a child. He was in the center of his father's will. He was doing his business, doing his, um, his dad's business. You know, what's remarkable about it is that, like I said, he, he, um, Jesus was a, ch- was a child, and kids can be, can hit the bullseye. Sometimes kids hit the bullseye better than adults. You know, they hear, they hear sometimes, uh, to me, from my, my, um, um, in my, in my personal, like, um, perspective would, um, would be that sometimes kids hear better than adults from God. You know, Jesus was a 12-year-old kid. You know, but he, pos- he positioned his heart towards his father and was aiming at a valid target. That's the key right there. He positioned his heart towards his father and was aiming at a valid target. He was aiming at a target and trying to hit the bullseye. You know, this should give us all hope and inspiration for listening to God and staying in the center of his will. If Jesus did it when he was 12 years old, we can do it when we're 40, we're 50, 60, 70. Even if we're 100 years old, we can still be in the center of his will. I have a neighbor, and, uh, you know, he, he, his wife passed away, and he was like, I don't know why I'm here. I'm just like, you know what, you're here, but you have a reason to be here. You know, you have a reason to be here. You know, if God wanted to take you, he would have took you. And you know what, this is God, you're in the center of God's will. You're here, you're helping other people, and it's just like, even though you don't feel it, even though you don't see it, you have, you're in the center. Don't you agree? I agree, and I tell him that and stuff, and I know he misses his wife dearly, but you know what? God has another target for him to shoot at, and he's doing a good job. He helped me this week. This week. All right, let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 3, and this is verses 21 and 22. And this is something that we all want to hear. We want to hear, we want to hear um, in this verse, everybody wants to hear this. Okay, so, uh, Luke chapter 3, verses, we'll start with verse 21. And John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven, the heavens, the heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended in the bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, everybody, I'm saying this is really important. You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. When God says he's well pleased, I think you hit, you hit the bullseye. And that's what we want to hear. We want to, we want to hear God say, you know what, I'm well pleased with you. I'm very proud of you. We see in these verses, Jesus was baptized and his father was well pleased. You know, the words well pleased mean that you're hitting the tar- you're hitting the bullseye. You know, it was God's will that Jesus be baptized so he could fulfill his purpose and have the strength and power to do so.
the strength and power to do so. Is, it, is, uh, is God ever say well, said well pleased to you? Anybody here? He's well pleased with you? Hope so. Don't be bashful. So once again, uh, you know, Jesus was in his father's, was hitting one of his father's target. He was baptized and his dad said, you know what? I am pl well pleased. Let's turn to, uh, we're gonna, now we're going to turn to Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Okay. And this right here, this is uh, when, this is when um, Satan was tempting Jesus. Starting with verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, which we are too, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they, uh, when they had ended, he was hungry. I'd be hungry too. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. Trying to, trying, trying to, trying to um, get to him because he knows that he's, he's not fully, has full strength because he's hungry. He's just, he's just, you know how you get hungry? You get hangry. Hungry, angry. But Jesus, no, uh, verse 4, but Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Center of the target right there. If he's not in the center of God's will right there, I don't know. If we're not in the center of God's will, I don't know. What do we do? We might do something. Verse 5, then the devil, the devil is relentless, isn't he? He just keeps on throwing, he just keeps on throwing them fastballs right at you. Taking up, then the devil, taking him up on a, on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. See, you see, you see how the devil, he's so slick and stuff that he wants to, he, he'll just do anything to basically throw you off, um, that, just throw you off your game. He'll show you, he showed him the kingdoms of the world. If that's important to you, you might fall victim to it. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you in their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Lie. Therefore, if you worship before me, and all will be yours. The devil, man, the devil's just so full of lies. He does, I'm saying, and this is, you know, and the kids, you know, it's only two kids in here, but I'm saying the devil just lies to you. He lies to you about, he, he throws lies in your head, so he puts fear in your heart sometimes, and you know what? The, the, devil, the devil's a liar. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Bullseye. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. <laughs> man, he's just coming. He's just like the devil, man. The devil is just, the devil likes to just attack, attack, attack. Like offense. It's like the Phoenix Suns in the 90s. Like Steve Nash. They score like 150 points a game. Attack, attack, attack. For, um, verse 10, that's what verse 9 says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from, um, from here. Um, verse 10, for it is written, if he shall, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. Let you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended, his, uh, ended every temptation, because you see, when when, when the devil tempts you and, you and you just you just don't take bait to it and stuff like that, he leaves. It says he departed from him until an opportune time. An opportune time. The devil's always looking for opportune times. He's looking for times when you're in isolation. He's looking for times when you're down on your luck. He's always looking for times when he can just get to you and punch you right in the where right, punch punch you right in the kisser. Jesus found himself face to face with the devil. You know, some of us would cringe and try to hide. 
You know, but Jesus was in the center of God's will and didn't miss a beat. You know, every time the devil tried to uh, uh, tempt Jesus, he used the word of God to shoot down the lies of the devil. He, uses the, he used the word of God to shoot down the lies of the devil. It is written. It is written. It is written you don't have to be fearful. It is written that you don't have to, um, you don't have to live like the world. When you're in the center of God's will, your place, um, when, when you're in the center of God's will, your will, you're in the place that you need to be in order to deal with the situ- which situations that may arise. So when you're in God's will, you're in the place that you need to be. So when situations arise, you'll be okay. You'll, you'll be able to take care of them. And situations, you're, are gonna, they're going to come. They're going to come. Everybody here knows has had situations come. And that's why, this is why discipleship is so important. You know, people come and they, they, they say, you know what, they do the sinner's prayer. And if that, we need to disciple people, don't we? We need to, we need to walk with them because, you know, they, they're still, you know, when you, when you do that minute of conversion, you know, that, that second of conversion, you're, you know, you're a believer, but you still have things coming against you. And we have to walk with people. And it's been on my heart for discipleship. We have to disciple people. You know, I'm saying they can't walk it out. When, when, they become, when they become a Christian, you know, and they step onto the world, they're going out there blindly again. We got to teach them. We got to train them. We got to walk with them and sh- show them how to deal with things in a Christian way, right? You know, don't you think, don't think, don't you think you will face, you won't face things because we're going to face things. We're going to face things as soon as we walk out this door. You may face them when you're in here. I don't know. You know, we live in a fallen world with fallen people. That's just the way it is. But God, amen. We're going to conven- uh, continue with verse uh, f- in, in Luke 4, verses 14 to 19. And this is when uh, Jesus be- begins his Gal- Galilean ministry. Starting with verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and the news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Um, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, Naz- Nazareth, I'm sorry, where he had been brought up. And as his, cus- and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue of the, on the Sabbath day and stood up to, the, uh, stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he op- had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set a liberty um, those who are oppressed, to pro- proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He was in a, he was in a, he hit the, he was in the tari, the bullseye. He was doing that. He was, that's what God, he, that's why he was sent here. The spirit of the Lord was upon him. He's anointed. He, he was anointed. The, the will of God was guiding Jesus. He was anointed by God to, to preach the gospel, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, give sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed. We are too. We're here to raise the dead. I was talking to somebody, and I said, you know what? Have you, do you know anybody who's ever raised the dead? And he, this person knew one person. But that's, this should be our, you know, all these things that Jesus did should be our normal Christian life. Healing blind people, there should, there should be, you know, and it's not for, not for us to make us look good and stuff. It's for God to point people to God to know that, you know what, a, there is a God and he's real. Jesus was in the center of God's will, hitting the target set in front of him. This is, all, this is where we all want to be. We all want to be hitting the target. We all want to be where God wants us to be. If, I'm ta- and I'm talking, about, I'm talking about every aspect of life, marriage, job, church, wherever and stuff. It's everything. You want to be in God's will. You want to be where God wants you to be. Not where you want to be. Not where your family is because they've been going there for 50 years. It's the It's the truth. You know, all throughout the life of Jesus, even to his death, he remained in the will of God. Jesus lived life in the center of the bullseye. Let's look at Luke. We're going to look at one more uh, set of uh, scripture. Luke um, chapter 22. 
And this, in the, uh, this is um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. So Luke um, uh, chapter 22, starting with verse 39. Starting with verse 39, coming out, he went, up, he went to the Mount of Olives, and he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. I was talking, I was, when I was reading this, I didn't, I'm not really sure what that means, but I guess um, that he, did, he was praying that they, um, that they, he wanted them to pray that they wouldn't be tempted. I'm not sure, I've been, I was trying to study that, I didn't understand what that meant. Uh, verse 41, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Bullseye. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Jesus was where he, should have, where he needed to be at that time. It was all about being in his father's will for Jesus. Even if it was in agony, even if he was sweating blood. Even when Jesus was in agony and began sweating blood, because he knew what he was going to endure, he positioned himself to stay in the center of the target. He could have easily just been like, you know what, I'm not going to deal this right here. This is too much for me. But he didn't. He stayed in his Father's will. You know, this sums up our Christian walk. Jesus hit the bullseye his 33 years on earth. Not once did he falter from being in the center of his Father's will. And if Jesus, who became flushed, did it, we can. If you believe that, say amen. We can live our life being in God's will until we leave this earth and go to our permanent home. Because this is only a temporary place. I want, I want to leave you with three practical ways to be in the center of God's will. And it's probably, you know, some of it's probably not new. But God just told me to... He told me to, um, to tell you this. The first way to be in the center of God's will, number one, easy, easy thing, pray. It seems like a no-brainer, but it's often forgotten by new and seasoned Christians. I'm not going to lie. It happens, it happens to me, like, it happens to me a lot. Sometimes I forget to pray, and that's what I should be doing. That's what I should do. I, but you've got to renew the mind and get, that, to get the mind right and train it. Renew the mind. The truth of the matter is that unless you pray, talk to God, or whatever, whatever way you, want, you say it, it will not be in the center of God's will, or, or you won't be able to hit the bullseye. So you have to pray. That's the first thing. That's the first thing that we should do is, be, is pray. Number two, be obedient. If you know God's will, you have, to, you have to have obedience to actually live in it and stay in it. In the biggest, and, and, one of, and, that, and at the, the end of that sentence, and stay in it, you want to stay in his will. Because a lot of times people get into the center of that target, and after that, they, they kind of just like slide off the target, and they're not hitting that target. They're hitting something that's not even supposed to be hit. You know, no one, no one ever said it's going to be easy or a piece of cake. You know, but however, knowing you're in the center of God's will is one of the greatest gifts of being alive. Knowing that when you wake up in the morning, you're doing what God, you're, you're, at, you're where God wants you to be at. That's probably one of the best things in life. It's better than drinking coffee. It's greater than any accomplishment you'll ever achieve. I don't care if you get a PhD, a DHP, whatever, whatever you want to call it, a master's and whatever. It, being in God's will is more important than just, it is more important than just anything that you're ever going to accomplish in life. And, it, and God's been telling me this and stuff, and God's been, it's been on my heart a lot just, about just being in his will. And it's just like, I just want to do it. I want to be there. I want to be in his will. I want to do where he wants me to, 
I want to go where he wants me to go. I want to be, do what he wants me to do. And I just want to be in his will because I know anything outside of his will is nothing. It's, it's, it's just, it's, 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 it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter. Even if, the, you know, if friends or family tells me something or, or whoever, I don't care. I want to be what he wants me to be at. That's the most important thing. And number three is staying focused. If there's anything I've, have, have, uh, anything I've I have realized in life is that distractions come and go. You know, what, no matter what pops up or happens in life, we must stay focused if we're going to hit the bullseye. You know, sickness might come up. Job loss, divorce, it could be anything. And we have to, we got to stay, we have to basically stay focused. You know, you, you'll never hit what you can't see. You know, shooting for an unknown target is a wasteful and useless. It's, you're wasting your life if you're shooting for the wrong thing, if you're aiming at the wrong thing. You know, I, I, I really feel that's why many Christians give up and walk away from God, because they're not focusing on the right thing. They're, hitting, they're trying to hit targets. They're not even, there shouldn't even be a target. They're hitting, they're just, it's like a mirage or something like that. They're shooting right here, and God's got you a completely different direction. You know, they get tired, they lose hope, and they walk right into the wilderness. And, and some of them are never, seen, um, never to be seen again. And that's the truth. I just want to share one so, uh, quick story with you. Um, I have a, uh, it's, uh, it was a guy that I, uh, that I know, and um, I was talking to him one day, and he told me, you know what, he said, uh, he went to college for like, I think it was like waste management or something like that. I think it was waste management, and he, he was telling me about, yeah, you know what, I went to college, I did my thing, I, I got, after I got, graduated from college, I got a really high paying job, like six digits, and um, then he said, one day, he was at church, and it's changed his whole life, it was a pastor at the time, and he said, you know what, you're going to be a teacher, <laughs> and he was just like, man, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, and after that, then, then it kind of just kind of just started like, it was like what, that, that pastor put a seed in his heart. And if that, then if that, that seed, you know, when a seed is a seed, it's not really, it's just enclosed. Then if that, then for some reason, God set a water in that seed and it sprouted up and it sprouted up. Then if that, it became a flower and it became, it just became fruitful. And he ended up leaving his job that he made six figures for and he became a teacher. Hmm? A poor teacher. But he was in the center of God's will. What he thought he should be doing, which is good and everything, but it was, you know, it's it's it was it was a good good job he had, and I'm sure he had every good intention, but he, God had another plan. He had a target set up for him, and to this day he is hitting that target and he's doing a good job, and he's a very well respected. Um, superintendent. He's a real, real respected principal, and and you know my wife got a chance to talk to him, and he's very level-headed, and he does things, and he's you know he's not one of these you know these people that's just gonna jump on bad wagons because you know uh, some a doctor or some a professional told him that you should do it. He's very well-rounded, and I just and when he told me that story, it stuck with me because he is in the center of God's will. And it doesn't, make a, it doesn't make a difference that he's, not, he's making less money, but he's in the center of God's will, and that's where he's happy at, and that's where he's the most fruitful at, and he's changing people's lives. You know, so many kids that he comes in contact, contact with um, throughout the years, he's changing their lives, and it's like that's what God is, when he gets to heaven, I'm sure God's going to be like, you know what, well pleased. All right, if everybody could bow their heads. If there's anybody right, um, anybody here today, if you haven't made Jesus slaughter your life, I'd like you to raise your hand. All right. Um, you know, this message today is about being in God's, um, in, in the center of God's will. If, if, if you feel like you're just, if you feel like, you know, God is, is says something to you today or just, um, just, it's just in general, you feel like you're not that, you know, God's saying, you know what, I want you to do something different or, you know what, you're not, I, I, have, I have something better for you. I want you to raise your hand. Okay. We're just going to pray right now. 
God, for all those people that raise their hand, God, I just pray, God, I just pray that you would just, um, just position them, God, put them in a position and line things up for them so they can be, they can be in the center of your will, God, because that's where we want to be. That's where we're going to be the most effective. That's where we're going to be doing kingdom work, God. And God, I just pray that you would help them get there quickly. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is that they're, they're trying to, that wherever they want to be or whatever word that you gave to them, God, prophetic word, I, God, I just pray that you would just do it quickly, God, quickly. And we thank you for, we just thank you for today's word, God. I hope that it, it just, it, uh, it opened up people's um, hearts and, um, you know, it's all about you, God. It's all about being in the center of your will, doing what you want, you want us to do every day, each day, every day. And we thank you for everything that you're doing here at Lansing Calvary Assembly in Lansing, Jackson, United States. And I pray for the United States, God, that we can just become united, that we can be, become united, and we could, we could put the focus, we can, United States can, um, the, can just be in the center of your will, God, because right now I don't feel like it's, it, we are in the center of your will. I feel like we're divided, divided states. We need to be the United States um, where God feel, fearing um, country, God, and I just pray for the United States right now that we just be in the center of your will and we be doing everything that you want us to do, God, so we can just put you first and everything else second. And we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen.